Awesome. OK, I think I'll, I'll make a start uh, to the presentation. So thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Dr. Marta von der Maas. I work for Low Risk. Low Risk is a community interest company. And um, our goal is to make open silicon a reality. So taking the kind of uh, system that's worked really well for open source software and making that a reality for silicon hardware, um, uh, et cetera. So a little bit about, about low risk. So our tagline is open to the core. Uh, we're located in Cambridge, UK and in Zurich, Switzerland. And um, as I said before, our mission is to make open silicon a reality. And uh, it's very important for us that verification and a fully verified silicon is part of that, that answer. And verification, I mean, uh, I mean what you would usually say as testing in, in software. So that's, that's what verification in, in silicon terms means. And a little bit of a, an introduction to our big project, OpenTitan. So OpenTitan is a, a silicon root of trust. This is a chip that you can put in your products, and it'll provide security services like Secure Boot. Um, we have lots of partners. We're very grateful to all those partners for making OpenTitan a reality. It's, uh, it really is not cheap to make a chip that is fully verified, and you can, you're able to tape it out. Um, taping out means that you're actually manufacturing it and actually creating chips out of it. So without their, their support, this really would not be possible. So I'm going to make the case here that open silicon is hard. But why is open silicon hard? So first of all, there aren't really any real examples. So there, there are some open source hardware projects out there, but none of them to the level of where you can say these are fully verified. All the verification collateral is out there. Um, you want you, all of your design verification. You want all of your CI runs, all of those logs to be open. So that's really what we're talking about with an open source example of hardware. So that just really doesn't exist. Open Titan is kind of its first of its kind there. Another reason why open source silicon is more difficult than open source software is that updating is very different. So once you've manufactured your hardware, you can't update it anymore, right? You can, uh, you can update software, obviously, and the firmware that's running on top of it, but you cannot update the hardware itself um, unless you're going to really expensive ship a new chip to all of your customers. That's, that's obviously really expensive. On top of that, we have an ecosystem that um, has started out very close source. So we have, um, uh, for example, we have the tools from Synopsys and Cadence. Those EDA tools are used to actually translate your hardware design into what your chip would actually look like. Um, and we just need to support those types of tools because that's, those are the people that will actually uh, manufacture this chip. But we also want to support open source tools like Verilator and Verable. So we have, we have the challenge of supporting both the open and the closed world. And then the other two icons on this slide are UVM, which is a verification methodology. It's a way to write tests for your, for your uh, silicon. And this is inside the system Verilog language, which we also use to define um, your hardware. So that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to straddle these two, two worlds. And that's another reason why open source silicon is difficult. Um, so wh what progress are we making with Open Titan? We're not solving everything. But if you look at this slide, uh, the red is what's open source, and the gray is what's proprietary. So in, in the usual silicon world, uh, you might have some open source firmware. You might have some open source PCB designs. But um, everything else will be proprietary. In OpenTitan, we actually open source a lot of the stuff, including the RTL, which is the actual design of your, your hardware. We have the SOC architecture, the instruction set architecture. Some of you may know RISC-V. RISC-V is, is an open instruction set, so that is what we're using in this, in this pro process. And also the firmware. We, we open source all of our firmware, which is not always a given. Uh, with chips. There are still some gray blocks, as you can see. So for example, the process design kit or the foundry uh, hardware IP blocks, the analog IP blocks. Um, so we're not solving all of these things, but we are making progress. 
Um, for example, there are examples of the physical design kit. Um, there are open source examples of those. Um, not many of those are used in commercial chips, but at least we're making progress there. There's at least one flow where you can get a completely open source uh, chip. And in terms of license, uh, we've learned from the software world. So we wanted a license that was very permissive. We wanted a license that be, can be able to be used in open source, but we also needed to be able to be used commercially. Uh, because those are the people that will actually take this design and actually tape it out. And another reason for this is um, Open Titan is a secure root of trust. And one of the reasons to take that particular use case is to really raise the level of kind of the minimum level of security in, your, in, the, in the industry. So not every person or every company designs their own uh, security root of trust and you don't really know what the level of security is, now at least they can take Open Titan and they can still put their, all, their own secret little sauce on top of it, but you have that base level of security that you can rely on in the industry. And we believe Apache License 2.0 is, is the correct uh, license for us uh, to permissively license Open Silicon. Uh, what are other things that we've learned from software? So we really want to uh, leverage the lessons that open source software has learned. Um, so open source, it sounds kind of, duh, why are we doing open source? But um, it's not just the code, obviously, it's the design verification, so the testing environment that you want to have open source. You want your issue tracked, you want your decision-making process, all of this stuff open source, and that's the case for Open Titan. You can go on GitHub and actually see all of it working. Also, version control, uh, this is something that we've learned from open source software. Uh, continuous integration, so this kind of continuous integration cycle is super powerful. I, I don't have to convince any of you here, but really applying that in silicon, making sure that every single pull request is tested, making sure that there's nightly regressions on the main branch that make sure that you don't have any, um, yeah, that you make sure that everything on the main branch is always working correctly and making sure that all of these logs and artifacts are truly open source. And that's not easy to do because a lot of our tests we have to r run on proprietary tools. So making all those test results available uh, is something that, that is not, uh, yeah, not easily done uh, in silicon. Another aspect is differential fuzzing. So differential fuzzing is a popular software testing technique where you take two, um, two programs and give them the same input and see if the output is the same. So two, two different programs that are supposed to do the same thing. And you can do a very similar thing in silicon. So for example, in this case, we have a model and an implementation. Uh, the model could be a, uh, an ISA simulator, uh, for example, a RISC-V simulator. Um, and the model and the implementation could be our uh, CPU, which is called IBEX, RISC 532-bit CPU. And then you cr have a testing um, framework that creates constrained random instructions and makes sure that the model and the CPU actually do the same thing. Coverage, a well-known concept in software. We also use this in, in hardware. So we have uh, example code coverage. We have test pass rates, uh, functional coverage. All of this increases the confidence that our design is uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. And we can also learn from for formal verification in um, functional programming languages, for example, and then use formal analysis to prove properties of our hardware. So we do all of those things, and then we also add things like uh, finite state machine uh, coverage and toggle coverage, which are a little bit more specific to hardware. And then governance, um, governance uh, doing open source, as we, as we actually learned in, one of the, in the keynotes, um, it's not just about making your source code open, it's also about having open governance. So we have a steering committee uh, to make project-wide decisions and working groups uh, that focus on specific tasks. We have standards and development practices uh, to make sure that everybody is on the same platform, everybody has the same environment to work off of, um, and we have a workflow that includes code review and issues. So yeah, this is kind of the introduction uh, of the talk. Um, are there any questions uh, so far? Uh, that's good. I'm assuming that that's a good sign. 
So then let's go uh, specifically into uh, Open Titan. So we believe that Open Titan does it right. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about kind of the high level verification setup that we have for Open Titan. So this is Open Titan. Open Titan, this is a block diagram of Open Titan. Um, you can see lots of individual hardware IP blocks. Um, so part of making open silicon a reality for low risk is making sure that we have a library of hardware IP blocks that anybody can use uh, to do specific tasks. Um, but in terms of verification, how do you know that each of these blocks are doing the right thing? How do you know that each of these blocks, even if they individually test to do the correct thing, um, how do you make sure that they interoperate seamlessly? And so this is really the tough question that we're, we're trying to answer here. Okay, so we have three different tracks. So we take our design and we do simulation on it. So simulation, you can do both block level uh, simulations where you just take your block and you um, uh, run individual tests on them. But you can also do chip level uh, simulations where you do interoperability tests. Then we have FPGA tests. So FPGA is a field programmable gate array. This is programmable hardware, um, but it's actually a, a physical chip, so you don't have uh, internal uh, knowledge of the internal signals like you do with simulation. But it is very useful because it's actually running on hardware, and you can, for example, connect some uh, breakout boards to them to make sure that it interoperates with external devices that you need to interoperate with. And eventually, we will add uh, silicon to this, uh, this um, design framework as well. And then as I mentioned, we have all those different uh, IP blocks, but each of these IP blocks can be at different stages of development and verification. So uh, we, we've designed these uh, kind of labels that you can label each of these blocks and make sure that uh, once, you try, once you try to hit a milestone for the whole chip, you can kind of work block by block. And so you, you go through specification, uh, developing uh, an initial version. Then functional means that you have kind of all the functions there, and you're kind of generally happy with, uh, with the design and the verification. We have a separate, uh, a separate uh, stage for security. So these are security countermeasures that you need in, your, in, a, in, a, in a chip like OpenTitan. And then once you're happy with all those design and the verification, you can sign off complete. So that's the D3 and V3. And then once you have all of your blocks, be D3 and V3, then you sign off the complete chip and you can do a proper manufacturing of that, of that chip. So it's quite a rigorous process. I haven't uh, specified exactly what, what we use, but on our documentation, you can see the very specific criteria for each of these, these stages. And that kind of comes back to, as I said, the documentation is uh, open source, but also the dashboards are open source. So you can go to the Open Titan website, and you can see the results of this is the results of the latest nightly, where you can see the actual coverage, the coverage and the pass rate for the chip in general, but also for each of the individual IP, IP blocks. So that's uh, what we believe is very uh, important. OK, is that all a little bit clear? So this is kind of the high-level overview, and I'll go now go into a little bit more of the details. But are there any questions so far? OK, good. Um, so then, let's go a little bit more into the details about verification of OpenTitan. So I'll uh, zoom back out. So this is the complete uh, chip overview. So we have all these different IP blocks. And I mentioned earlier that we would do specific block level tests. So I, I'll zoom in on one of those blocks, which is the top, um, do I know my left and my right? Top left, IVEX. Um, so IVEX is our, our CPU. Um, you can go on GitHub and see it. Uh, it's production quality. Um, so that means that it's been extensively used, both closed source and open source projects, and it's undergone multiple tape outs. So that's why we believe it's, it's very mature. And it's not just the hardware that's open source, it's also the whole design verification environment that, that we've created around it. 
Now, kind of going into um, IBEX, we have a three-stage pipeline. It's a relatively simple processor, instruction fetch, execute, and write back. And those three pipeline stages interact on the one hand with the internal registers, and then on the other hand with the memory. And the memory is protected by this thing called EPMP, which is a memory protection unit. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that uh, now. So I want to talk to you about how, what steps we did to verify EPMP. So before I do that, I want to explain what EPMP is. So EPMP is Enhanced phys Physical Memory Protection. Um, in IBEX, uh, or at least the version of IBEX that we use in OpenTitan, we have 16 of these regions. So you can specify 16 different regions with different permissions. So it has different permissions and different region sizes. Uh, for example, the table I show here is the different types of regions you can specify in PMP. Uh, zero obviously means that you're not using that region at the moment. Top of range means um, it's the address in this uh, particular region um, up until the address of the previous one. Uh, then we have two that are kind of standalone. So NA4 is a, just a four byte region. So you can set the permissions on four bytes specifically. And then NAPOT is a power of two aligned region. So these are, these are very different types of regions. And you, you have to do, in your verification, you have to make sure that you hit all of these um, types of regions uh, fairly, if that makes sense. So then that's kind of the physical memory protection side of things. And, but then when they added the E to it, the enhanced part to it, um, they wanted to make sure that even in M mode, which is the uh, highest privilege mode in your processor, even that mode should be restricted. So that's why, why they call it enhanced. And they did that with three um, kind of separate permission bits. So the first is machine mode lockdown, which allows you to create regions that are um, accessible in your user programs, but not in your kernel. So that's kind of like a weird asymmetric thing. So usually everything that's accessible in user land is also accessible in, in, your, in M mode. Um, so th that locks that down. Then there's also MMWP, which is an interesting thing where usually um, your PMP, if if you're in your M mode execution and a region is, you're trying to access a memory that's not in your PMP, you're allowed to access it. But the whitelist policy means that if it's not in your PMP, you're not allowed to access it. So that's an extra little bit of security um, when you're in M mode. And then because these uh, MML and MMWP um, kind of add extra restrictions to M mode, they also had to add this rule lock bypass, which allows you to temporarily bypass the locked rules. Um, and this is usually used in the setup where you kind of bypass the locks, you set everything up, and then you un undo the, the bypass. OK. So that, this is kind of the background to PMP, um, EPMP. So for, for the testing side of things, I wanted to show you a little bit about um, what this does to our state space. So initially, without the enhanced part, we just had these sets of permissions. So we had the lock, the write, the read, and the execute bit, and all the different combinations that you can have with that. But now that you add uh, MML to it, each of these uh, regions actually have different permissions. So you actually double the amount of state space. So what each of these regions exactly do is not super important. But it's the important part of it that you're, is, is that you're doubling the space, state space. The other aspect of it is that the setup process becomes a lot more difficult. So um, just from the beginning, if you don't have MML or MMWP, um, you can just go from the top. So you can, you can boot up. You can not worry about MML and MMWP. You can configure your PMP with random regions, and then you can just start your test. That's, that's how we used to do things. But that doesn't work when you have these machine mode lockdown and machine mode whitelist policies. Uh, why doesn't that work? Uh, because uh, you need your code and your trap handler to be executable, for example. So if you enable, if you don't set any regions and you enable machine mode whitelist policy, you cannot execute where you're currently in your program. 
if that makes sense, because you're not allowed to access anything that's not in your PMP. So you have to make sure that there's something in your PMP before you enable the whitelist policy. So that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to show with this diagram. So as I mentioned before, if you do have MML or MMWP, you first enable the rule lock bypass so that you can safely change things before you kind of get <laughs> um, all your permissions are wiped under your feet. Uh, then you generate a random code region, which allows you to make your test code and your uh, trap handler executable. There's also a kernel stack, which you need to make sure are read and writable. And there's a signature entry, which is used for testing uh, purposes. Um, if MML mode is set, you need to make sure uh, that the code uh, entry is set to executable both before and after MML. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation. As I said, said before, we have those different permissions, um, but if you, because in machine mode lockdown, you don't have the same permissions as you do in uh, user mode anymore, uh, you need to make sure that your code entry actually, like the permissions that you have, even if you have execute permissions before you set MML, you might not have it afterwards. So you need to make sure that the entry that you set of the code that you're currently running is executable both before and after setting MML. Otherwise, you get wiped, and then you are in an infinite loop of traps. Um, so then after that, then you can enable MML and MMWP, and then you can actually start configuring the random regions that you generated at the beginning. And then once you're happy with it, then you set the actual rule lock bypass that you needed. Um, so sometimes you want to test enabled or disabled. And then after that, you go into your actual test. Um, so that's what I'm trying to uh, say with this diagram. Then, what did we achieve? How did, what, yeah, so before we had 66% uh, coverage of our uh, PMP functional coverage points. So this includes just the regular uh, PMP testing that we'd, we had done before. Then we added some static tests to just say, OK, let's enable MML, let's enable MMWP, let's see what, what happens. So those are just static tests. We got quite a good uh, jump from 66 to 86%. And then we did the step that I just described, where we actually do full random um, configuration, and we got from 86 to 95%. Um, now, even with the full random, um, even with the fully random testing, we still had this 5% that we, we, we didn't uh, cover. And so we added some directed tests to make sure that we cover them. And what are those? Uh, for example, one of the caveats of MML, uh, machine mode lockdown, is that once you lock things down, you're not allowed to add any regions that are also executable. You're not allowed to add code regions. That's one of the rules of MML, but that was not being tested by our completely random um, configuration, or at least not reliably, obviously, like sometimes it does get tested. Um, then, as I mentioned before, there's these four byte regions that you can test. Um, our initial test wasn't hitting those reliably. You need to bias your random address generation to actually hit these four byte regions if you do set them. Um, and then the other thing is, um, because the test usually is in one part of memory, it usually just hits one PMP entry. What you want to do for certain tests is that you actually go through all of the PMP entries and try to execute from each of them. So those are the kind of directed tests that we, we used. And this is um, at least in a high overview how we tested ePMP. I know it was a bit <laughs> a bit convoluted, but is there any, can I clarify anything to anybody on EPMP testing? Um, otherwise, I'm going to go on to the next thing. So um, part of Open Titan is that we uh, have a lot of primitive blocks. So primitive blocks are essentially like a standard library for silicon. So every single block will use things like alerts or clocks or FIFOs. Etc. So there's a lot of varieties of these things in our library, and we make sure that um, yeah, we make sure that the whole project uses these particular primitive blocks, and they don't use their own thing. So that gives us a couple of nice things. Um, so one of the things that is very important in silicon testing is clock domain crossing testing. So sometimes in your chip, 
well, usually blocks are driven off of a clock, which is just a wave. So at each clock cycle, something happens. But if you have a big chip, you often have multiple clock domains, so multiple different clocks. And that means that sometimes uh, when you have two clocks interacting with each other, um, there will be like a one cycle delay between uh, one signal but not the other signal, just because of that domain crossing. So what we can do in our primitive library, we have this thing called the prim CDC ran delay. Um, and we can implement that in all the uh, flip-flops that we, we would like to use. And the way that we do things is um, we give it the previous data, the source data, and the destination data. Uh, then it generates a random uh, bit mask to say certain parts of the signal I'm going to delay, delay certain parts I'm not going to delay. Um, and then uh, you kind of multiplex the output based on either the previous data or the source data. Um, and the reason why each uh, wire is kind of individual is because if you're physically on the chip, each wire can have a different length, for example. So sometimes one wire will uh, be delayed while the other one happens one clock cycle before. So that's one of the really powerful things about um, having this standard primitives library. And then a little bit more on a high level, so we believe that OpenTitan has kind of seven virtues that we believe that every successful open silicon project should do. Uh, the first one is being commercially relevant, so making sure that um, commercial companies would like to use this and also um, are able to. Then having a repository, that's kind of a given, but also having a repository that um, has all the decision making, the issue tracking, all of that open source. The tree stands for provenance, so uh, provenance of the hardware IP blocks, that's very important. Uh, you don't want to use certain hardware IP blocks that don't uh, abide to your license, um, but you also don't want to, um, yeah, you don't want to use certain proprietary blocks accidentally and then some other company when they're using this this open source project get into legal trouble. So that's something that's really important. Verification, that's what I've been talking about uh, a lot, uh, but we need to make sure that CI is open source or um, accessible to everybody and, um, and the dashboards, as I mentioned. Then documentation and training, all of that is open source, so you can go to opentitan.org, find everything there. We have clear governance, uh, making sure that we have clear processes um, for anybody to make a change. So we have this kind of formal uh, request for change uh, policy where anybody, any partner uh, or any person participating in the project can ask the steering committee or the working group to do something. And the last one here is focus. So we want to be focused and not too overambitious because it's such a big task to do open silicon. We decided to take this very specific use case of creating a root of trust um, and that's what we, we did, and that's what OpenTitan is trying to achieve. So after uh, an amazing verification effort, um, OpenTitan hit a frozen milestone, which is a very big milestone for open silicon. So once we have this frozen milestone, we can actually do a tape out, so actually manufacture our design, and we are expecting to receive test chips back uh, based on this freeze uh, very soon and hopefully add that little block that I said in the beginning where you have the FPGAs and the silicon and the simulation. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and then finally, uh, here's a URL. Um, so you can see the slides, but also uh, this has all the notes. So notes and links. Um, so it's not just the slides. It's a, it's a complete handout. And also uh, feel free to send me an email about anything if you're, uh, if you're interested. Um, yeah, and thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions now as well. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Good. Uh, one question on how many caches does the IBEX port have and what protection do you have against side and side channels? So there was a question here about um, what kind of caches the IBEX core has and whether it has any protection against side channel attacks, right? So um, the IBEX core, uh, because our op the OpenTitan chip has lots of different uh, blocks to do 
Um, for all the expensive operations, like if you want to do RSA or ECDSA or AES, any kind of cryptographic optimization, um, there's a separate hardware IP block, so it doesn't need to be very high performance. Um, we don't actually have a data cache, so we, we, um, we just interact directly with memory. Uh, we do have an instruction cache, um, and that, that does exist in the IBEX. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? Great. And uh, you can also build IBEX without the iCache, by the way. But um, yeah. Now the Windows hardware blocks that do the crypto, they, they are themselves protected against the. Yes, so we have, uh, we have, this is also open source. There's a whole Open Titan uh, side channel analysis repository. Um, so there's, mu there's multiple types of side channel attacks you have to protect against. Uh, for example, timing attacks, um, power analysis, um, yeah. It's, yeah, the, it's all open source, so you can, you can find that. One of the things that we do, for example, we have a big number block, which does the um, asymmetric cryptography, and that one does masking. So there was, there was one person who had looked at analyzing the program to make sure that these two different key parts never met. So that's, that's something that we do and make sure that the code that we run on these hardware um, accelerators are, are also secure. Great. Any other questions? I know there's some a fun night in the in the stadium waiting awaiting us. Great. Well, thank you very much for all your attention, and uh, please do um, send me an email if you think of anything else or um, contact Low Risk in in any other way. So thank you very much.